Good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Just uh, one other announcement as we get going. We've also got another carol service going on the 20th of December, which we always do a carol service up at the War Vets, uh, up on Coroy Plateau, which is a really big retirement village. And uh, we go into one of the... Um, one of the hostels there and, uh, and do a service. So we'd love to have some singers uh, to come and join us. So that's at 10 a.m. up at the War Vets. You can uh, ask us if you want more details. But um, Sue and Shannon, they serve there so faithfully week after week, uh, just bringing the gospel, loving people. Uh, and it's great for us to go and support them uh, in doing a carol service. So if you can be around on the 20th, then we'd love you to go and sing. And um, really, you don't have to be able to sing uh, extremely well to go. It's just a lot of fun. And every year I've gone, it's a lot of fun. The one year, I'm going to get carried away, but the one year we were like all standing here, and there was this guy in one of those motorized things that was in it, and he kept coming closer and closer trying to run us over. And I remember Steve Brading holding him back uh, so that he wasn't going to run the choir over. So you never know what's going to happen. It's full of excitement. Uh, so it's great fun, but it's just wonderful to chat to people, you know, uh, it's wonderful just hearing stories uh, and having a good time, so I'd encourage you to get there if you can. So we are on the last chapter of Hebrews uh, this morning, which is exciting, so I'm going to start by reading it. So for a change, to honor God's Word and to focus on it, let's stand, now that you've all got comfortable, and uh, I'm going to read um, Hebrews 13, it'll be up on the screen as well. <clears throat> Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not eating ceremonial foods which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of an animal into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us, then, go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore, for here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact I have written to you quite briefly. 
I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with all of you. Amen. Please sit down. Isn't that amazing? I was a bit worried, you know, he said, um, I've written to you briefly. I don't know how many weeks we'd have had to carry on if he'd written uh, not briefly. But there's a lot in this brief thing. But this is the big finale, the big final conclusion. And I wanted us to watch a finale. So uh, last week we were at um, School Spectacular, which uh, is truly spectacular. Apparently it is the biggest a variety show put on by school kids in the world. Five and a half thousand kids uh, from New South Wales take part, and uh, it really is quite spectacular. It's in the Kudos Bank Arena uh, out at Homebush, and we were there because uh, Rachel was in the choir, one of the two and a half thousand in the choir, so we could, we, we, she waved, we could barely see a speck. Um, but Matthew Simmons, he was a featured artist with his drumming, which was amazing. It was on the big screen, and uh, he did extremely well. Uh, so it's an amazing thing. This is just from my phone as we sit it up in the heavens of the arena looking at the grand finale. That is a grand finale. Five and a half thousand kids going berserk. It was, was really brilliant and really exciting to see. Uh, when I was zooming in there up on the stands, there was Rachel somewhere in one of those blocks <laughs> up on the, the choir there. Uh, so, yeah, that was quite spectacular. And uh, that's what grand finales are. They're these big things. And, and here we come to the end of Hebrews. And um, I don't know about you, but when, when I read first chapter 13... I thought, it almost feels like a bit of a letdown, really. I thought there have been so many kind of great moments in Hebrews, and we've journeyed through this letter. We've been shown again and again how amazing and incredible grace is that Jesus is just way, 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 way better than anything else. Any other option just pales in significance. And We've come to understand a bit of the complexity and detail of the old covenant sacrificial system, but then seen that it, it only worked in part, and it only dealt superficially with our sin, but didn't actually change the heart. And we've received warnings uh, about not taking this grace that we have received for granted. And we've had warnings and exhorted not to refuse God who speaks to us. 
We've been taught what true faith is, taking our eyes off our immediate surroundings and fixing our eyes on the unseen Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So we've had these amazing moments uh, within Hebrews that have been really challenging, they've been awesome, they've been life-changing. And then we get to chapter 13, and we seem to come down to a list of instructions, some do's and don'ts, things to do, things not to do. Or as one commentator excitingly headed it, a list of ethical implications of Christian doctrine. It does not sound very exciting. It doesn't sound like the big grand finale. And we've got a question, well, what is, is this what it comes down to, that actually in the end, Christianity comes down to some do's and don'ts. It comes down to some rules. Yeah, you've spoken about all this great stuff, Jesus better than anything, but in the end, do we revert to just actually you need to do this, you need to do that? And maybe even if you're here and you're not a Christian, maybe you think, oh, I knew that all along. That's, that's what I thought Christianity was. Isn't it just a list of rules? I've got to live this way. I've got to stop doing these things that I enjoy doing. I've got to do other things. I've got to give my money away. I've got to love people. Is that, is that what it comes down to? Is that what this grand finale is? Well, I'm sure you know that I'm going to say that that is not the truth. That is not the truth. The reason that this is an awesome grand finale is because the writer has come at it from every angle. He's shown us that Jesus is better, that He's better than angels. He's better than having angels here. He's better than having Moses here. He's a better mediator for us to the Father. He's, he's the best sacrifice ever because He was absolutely spotless, perfect, the Son of God, and yet He sacrificed Himself for us, better than any animal could ever be, a better sacrifice, that He is a better Savior than anyone. And He's shown us this from every angle. And now, the writer shows us that from this firm foundation of grace that Jesus has won for us, actually, we can tackle anything. We can actually tackle anything. There is nothing that actually we cannot have the power to press into the things that God has for us by His grace. The power of grace sets us free to press into any situation. And He gives us here examples of, if you like, the big three, sex, money, power. Sex, money, power. Those three things are big things that the world struggles with and goes after and that we struggle with as Christians. And he speaks into all three in this final chapter because he's showing us that we don't have to try and do better in these things. We don't have to try and live and, and try and, in my own strength, I'm going to do it. But having said everything and shown the freedom that we've come into, this true rest that we found in Jesus Christ, because His grace has been lavished on us, that as we've come into this true rest, actually now these things don't hold power over us anymore. They don't hold power over us anymore. And we can actually live in a holy way, we can live in a godly way, because of the power of grace in our lives. Because grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness, it teaches us that not by saying, you naughty boy, you've done the wrong thing. It teaches us by saying, Jesus has died for you, you've done the wrong thing, and it's forgiven, 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 forgiven. You're accepted, accepted, accepted. That's what grace does, and, and we stand there amazed. What? I'm, I'm forgiven? Even for all the wrong things I've done, I'm, I'm forgiven, and I've sinned again, and I'm forgiven again? And that changes my heart, you see, what the law could never do, because it just dealt with the outward sin. It starts to change my heart, and my heart is renewed, and suddenly I've got a heart that wants to live for God, because I'm forgiven, 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 accepted, accepted. And so my heart now is in a whole new place. It's become a heart of flesh, rather than a heart of stone. And this heart of flesh starts to pump 
for Jesus Christ. And it starts to get filled up, like when we have a worship time, like we've just had, where my heart, oh, it's just filled up again to glorify God, to exalt Him, to bring Him praise. And so this is an amazing finale because He gives us these examples and says, but you can actually know freedom and holy life in all these things. You have a God who is unchanging, who is faithful to you. We read in verse 8, and Miles quoted earlier, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And that means that His love for you has not changed since He was beaten and then horrendously crucified on the cross. His love for you, 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 each one of you and me, has not changed from that day to now till tomorrow. It's going to continue on forever. His love is unchanging yesterday and today and forever. And so we need to be encouraged by this grace. We need to take on this grace and then look at how we live and what, what it means, how we work it out in our lives. Verse 9 says, it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. Our hearts need to be strengthened again and again by this grace. You need to hear the grace of God that's lavished on you again and again. You need to know that you are forgiven again and again. That when you feel like, oh, I've just been living for myself, I've just been living for myself, that actually the answer is not to say, God, I'm sorry I'm such a mess, so I'm just going to keep moving away. The answer when we realize we're living for ourselves is to turn towards God because grace has paid, dealt with, paid the price, made us acceptable to the living, holy God. So we need to be encouraged and have our hearts strengthened to turn to God in this life that we are living. As we face the reality of a world that throws challenges at us daily and especially in these areas of sex, money, and power. The world is throwing us challenges uh, again and again in these areas. And we need to be strengthened by grace this morning. As we strengthen by grace, we receive power, as Paul says in Romans, to be more than conquerors through Him who loves us. That's who we are called to be. We are called to be more than conquerors, not just drifting through and eking our way through, I managed not to give in to those thoughts today, but actually going beyond that as we receive grace and actually knowing victory and being more than conquerors. So let's have a look at these areas of sex, power, and money that he talks about. So first one, sex, we see that we have the power to be pure. Grace gives us the power to be pure. We are called, as the writer puts it in verse four, 4, to keep the marriage beds pure. Keep the marriage beds pure. That means quite simply for those that aren't married, that you are to remain a virgin until you are married. It means for those that are married, that you are to remain totally faithful to your husband or wife. That's what it means, quite simply. And again, we face the challenge of that daily, possibly, as a single or as a married man or woman. You face the challenge of temptation coming across our path again and again and again. We see adverts and everything we watch just actually entices us towards pressing down that path, again and again, it's thrown in our face. You can be driving the road and there, you know, um, pictures on buses of virtually naked people it gets thrown in our face again and again. But we actually have the power to be poor, <laughs> pure rather than poor. <laughs> we'll get on to the poor part next. We get to money. But this one's pure. We have the power to be pure. So Jesus, so the writer here isn't asking them, as I've said, to do something that they can't do. This is the grand finale, that he's asking them to do something that actually they can do. Because through Jesus, we do have the power to be pure. We do have 
the power to live the way that God intended. We have the power to be single and pure as God intended, to be married and pure as God intended. Let's look at power. It's an interesting one here because we see we are given the power to submit. The power to submit. And the writer tells us in verse 17 that we ought to submit to authority and obey our leaders. Submit is a bit of a toxic word these days. We don't like the word submit. Submission, it's, it's, a, it's a very toxic word that's very loaded and is not a popular word in the world today. And the only reason really that we can entertain this word submission or to submit to authority is because of what Jesus has done in us. Because we have had the need to prove ourselves removed. We don't have to prove that we have power and authority, that we are the main men and women, that we control our lives. We don't have to prove that anymore because we've already given our lives over to Jesus Christ. We have already given our lives over. We've experienced His grace and He's won us. And so actually I know that I'm accepted. I know that I am chosen. I know that I'm a son of the living God. I've got all the affirmation that I need. All the affirmation that I need is found in God. It's actually all there. And as I receive His grace, as I receive that again and again in my life, I find actually I can submit. I've given, been given power to submit. And we see here that we need to submit. We need to be people who are under authority. That in fact to have authority, we also need to be under authority. We see also that we need to submit to leaders even when they don't get it right, because there's no qualification of them getting it right. But there is, in this verse, a clear qualification that they will be called to account for their leadership. Leaders will be called to account. If leaders lead you badly, if I lead you badly, I will be called to account. And that's a scary thing. That is a scary thing. And as leaders any type of leadership, we need to consider the weight of that, that how we lead, we will actually be called to account. But when I'm called to submit, I'm not called to do that based on whether the leader is going to get it right or not. We are called to submit and know that God will hold them to account. So we have security in the fact that we as God's sons and daughters, we can submit and we can humble ourselves, humble ourselves and submit. And humility is such an attractive quality. I know if you've met people who uh, are not, you know, self-effacing in a, in a wrong way, but are just truly humble. I think they're the most attractive people around. There's a great quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself but thinking of yourself less. Thinking of yourself less. That's really good. So it's not that we degrade ourselves because we are sons and daughters of the living God. We don't, it's not, humility is not about saying, I'm a terrible worm, I'm useless, I'm nothing. That's, that's not what humility is because we've been raised up. We're seated in heavenly places. We've been raised up by God. But humility is that actually I'm going to consider you before I consider myself. So we have the power to submit. What about money? Well, with money, we have the power to be content. The writer tells us in verse 5 that we are to keep our lives free from the love of money and to be content with what we have, to be content with what we have. I don't know about you, but I find this time of year particularly difficult uh, to be content with what I have uh, because we get sucked into all the good deals that are being offered. 
Um, JB Hi-Fi would be a weakness for me in terms of shops. And uh, as I get their emails and I see Black Friday sales and Cyber Monday sales, I think, oh my gosh, I could, I could get one of those. That's really, really cheap. Um, so I find JB Hi-Fi a definite challenge to my contentment, and especially uh, this time of year. But we need to daily let this Jesus, who is better than everything, be our contentment. This whole of Hebrews is really talking about Jesus being better than everything, that our contentment and fulfillment will be found in Him. It's where we to find our contentment. We saw in Hebrews 11 that despite all the terrible things um, the saints were going through, despite being sawn in two and killed in terrible ways, being poor and destitute, despite all of that, yet they had faith and could look to what was to come. They found a contentment in this Jesus who they hadn't even met yet because they knew that God was calling them to something further. We have met Him. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Wow, what contentment can we have? Contentment in who we are as children of God. And so our contentment needs to be based there, not in the physical things. <coughs> Excuse me. If we allow that to be our contentment, we will find we live very differently. It will change our decisions about how we deal with our money, whether it's about ourselves or whether we find that grace allows us uh, to find power to give. And you know that uh, in church we call you to give into the offering uh, for Grace City Church. It's not the only good thing to give to. There are many good things to give to. But out of what we do here as a church, it's all based on your giving. And you've seen, uh, as I've spoken about, uh, places in Southeast Asia, which I won't mention their names, but where we've taken money to, we've been able to bless people incredibly and uh, see the church strengthened there. We've been able to run things like food care, where every week there are hundreds of people whose lives are changed because of the finance that you give that enable us to do that. We've been able to run alphas and fun days with Love DY and all sorts of things where we've been able to bless the community. But it does require you to give. We're going to be talking more about this next year, but to do all we want to do, we actually need uh, more finance than we have. We're currently about 25% short of where we need to be in terms of church finance. So there's a, a call to give. But more importantly than any of that really is where is your contentment? Where do you find your contentment? Is it in buying stuff? Is it in uh, receiving things, making your life comfortable? Or is it found in Jesus? Lastly, we have the power to love strangers. Love, grace releases us to love. Not to love ourselves as the world encourages us to, but as it says, to love each other as brothers and sisters. We call to love strangers. We call to uh, love those that are suffering in prison, that are mistreated. We call to remember them, to pray for them, and to love them. We have and can have such a warped sense of love uh, as Hollywood uh, you know, speaks to us about uh, love just being feelings, and it's just about um, how you make me feel. We, we taught that again and again, really, by our culture, that love is just about how you make me feel. So that means my commitment to love can change from today to tomorrow because I might feel differently tomorrow. But here we find a love that is not based on feelings or even based on being reciprocated, but a love that is based on the intrinsic value that God gives to each of us. God gives value to each of us. He esteems each of us. He calls us His sons and daughters. And because of that, because of the sacrifice that He has made that enables each of us to be esteemed, we can love one another. So I'm going to finish there. If the band could come up, there are two things as I finish that I want us to think about as well. Firstly, in this chapter and through 
uh, the book in other places, the writer's been talking about the city, the city. And he refers to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And he refers to the city of the living God. And he calls us to consider this city that will endure forever rather than the city that we live in. Why a city? Well, a city is just a community of people, isn't it? So it's where there are a lot of people together in community. And God has made a new community, which is us, the church. That is the current expression of His community, of this city. You know, James spoke so well last week about Mount Sinai and about Mount Zion. And Mount Zion is called the new city, God's city, the city of the living gods that we're going to know as we uh, are with Him in eternity. But we know it now as well as the church. And we can live together in the city. And because of the way we need to live for the city, it should cause us to have a high view of the church. This is the gathered people of God, the church. Obviously, the church right across the world is that, but we are a local expression of it. And so we call to have a high view of the church and to set our mind, really, on the church. Secondly, we see that we are called to make a sacrifice. So after all this talk of sacrifice, Jesus being the better sacrifice, we find that we don't need to sacrifice anymore except for this. It says we are called to make a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice of praise. What is a sacrifice of praise? Well, it's an expression of true heart devotion. An expression of true heart devotion. And that's what we call to constantly bring glory to God. As a city, as the church, we are called to bring glory to God, to express our love and thanks for Him again and again, to bring the expression of this grace that we have received, to bring it to life in the way that we live again and again and again. That is our sacrifice of praise. So let's stand. And I want to give us an opportunity to be strengthened by this grace, as it puts there. I want to give you an opportunity to know the power of grace in your life. And so I want to pray for you, but I also want to call you to respond to these areas that I've mentioned. If you need power to believe, firstly, if you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you actually need power to believe. And this is the awesome thing, is that God comes, He gives you faith to believe. Even that act is found in Him, so that nothing uh, can be said to have been in our own strength. So if you need the power to believe, I want you to respond. If you're a Christian and you need the power to be pure, I want you to respond. If you need the power to submit, I want you to respond. If you need the power to be content, I want you to respond. And if you need the power to love strangers in this city, then I want you to respond. So as we sing, I'm going to actually encourage you to come forward. It's just an act of saying, God, I want to receive more of your grace. I want to be strengthened by your grace. So I want to encourage you to come forward. And we're just going to pray for you. The ministry team will pray. There's nothing magical about coming forward, but it's a taking a step and saying, God, actually, I'm pressing in to receive more of your grace this morning, to be strengthened by you, by your grace this morning.